serve the Lord and be displayed by another. We ask that you would just begin to call on the Lord. We pray that the city of the Son will bring forth the promise. Third, the city will be like a parent and fall in some Make 
Jackson, Mississippi, 39204. Or you can download our Real One app. Then you can download our Real One app. And you can get that with you. And God bless you. That's all for that. Back in April 2020, when the pandemic hit, we thought that we would simply hit the pause button, and once the pandemic passed, we would simply hit play, and we would resume, go back to where we once were. But it's been said that the plans of mice and men often go awry. And while we would all love to return to the pre pandemic certainty we had in April 2020, 
But now the shape, the feel, and the mold of our ministry has changed. And we must face the reality of that change, acknowledging that we will be moving in unknown directions in the moment, days, weeks, and years ahead. And we must allow ourselves sufficient time to adjust, to relearn, and to adapt. Although we are yet discovering what that future would look like, we be can be confident in this, that he who has began, begun a good work in us would carry it out to its completion. We can take comfort in knowing that our God who is the author and the finisher of our faith, knows the end from the beginning, and not only that, he has written himself into our story with his son, Jesus Christ, going before us with his Holy Spirit living within us with goodness and mercy following us, letting us know that we have no reason to fear. And as I sought a message to share with you this first Sunday of resuming in-person worship, the story of the children of Israel resuming life in Jerusalem after 75 years of captivity in Babylon came to mind. The story is found in the book of Ezra, and I believe that we can glean much from it. But before I dive into the message, I would like to give you a little context on a word I will be using in the message as well as in the title. It's the word X. E-X, a prefix that means former things or things in the past. X can be used to refer to people, to persons, to places, to position, and things. For example, I used to be a fire captain with the Jackson, Mississippi Fire Department. But when I retired, I became an ex-fire captain with the Jackson, Mississippi Fire Department. That's what I formerly did, what I used to be in the past, but I am not that anymore. I'm an ex-fire captain. And with that definition of the word ex, E-X in mind, I would like to share a message with you on letting go of our ex to get to our next. Letting go of former things to receive present and future things. For we can't embrace the present nor the future while clinging to the past. We have to let go of our ex to get to our next. And I will be focusing on Ezra, the third chapter, verses 10 through 13. And I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestment were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asa, with cymbals, according to the direction of King David of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people responded with a great shout, when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and head of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundation, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could, could not distinguish the sound of the joyful noise from the sound of the people weeping. For the people shouted loudly, that the sound was heard far away by many. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us now go to our God in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day that you've made. And we have every reason to rejoice and to be glad in it. We thank you for loving us so much so that you gave us your only begotten son, Jesus the Christ. And through him, we have access into your presence. Lord, the veil in the temple has been torn from top to bottom, and we thank you that we can now boldly come before you. We thank you for your Holy Spirit to lead, guide, and direct us in all our ways. We acknowledge that you are God and that you are God alone. And although you know everything about us, before the word is formed on our tongue, 
but that you formed us out of the dust, Lord, and you know everything about us. We come to you today not because you do not know, but to let you know that we know that you know everything that we are going through. We thank you that your grace is sufficient for us at all times and for anything that we face. We thank you, Lord, that your peace surpasses all understanding, that your mercies endures forever, that your gifts are good and perfect, that your promises are sure, that they are yes and amen. We thank you for ordering our steps, for healing our sickness and our disease, and for your dear presence, even as we go through the valley of the shadow of death. We pray for the We Are One family and our brothers and sisters in the faith from near and far. We confess and repent our, of our sins and ask for your forgiveness and ask that, ask that you would strengthen us as we go along the way. And on today, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer you are. And I ask all this in Jesus' name, the only name that matters, amen. Amen. The people of Israel had a bilateral, a two-way conditional covenant with God that were based on mutual understanding. God would do this and they would do that. In Exodus 24:3. When Moses received the covenant from God on Mount Sinai and brought them down to the people and told them all of the Lord's words and his, and his laws, they responded with one voice. They said, everything the Lord has said we would do. And I don't even have to tell you who did not do what they said they were going to do. God had been a faithful partner in abiding by the demands of the covenant, but Israel turned to evil and started to serve other gods. And after giving them countless one more last chances to abandon these gods and to avoid all of this evil and to worship the one true God, after giving them all of these chances and their failing, God chastened them and he allowed them to be taken into a 75-year exile in Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar, and who completely, Nebuchadnezzar completely destroyed Jerusalem and their beloved temple that was built by King Solomon. I know you heard, you've heard before uh, me say before that there's only two things that can happen to us, that which God ordained and that which God allows. And here in our text, God ordained Cyrus, the king of Persia, to overthrow the Babylonians and to free the children of Israel to return to their homeland. And almost 50,000 Jews left Babylon and returned to Jerusalem, a 900-mile trip that took four months to complete. Likewise, I will be freed from the COVID-19 restrictions and returning to in-person worship we're not going to get back to where we were once. We're not going to get there overnight. And like the children of Israel in their 900-mile journey, in their four-month journey, it's going to take time and it's going to take effort for, them to, for us to be able to accomplish that. And as I thought about this and as I go into the next verse, you know, the most unpopular topic for a preacher to preach upon is what? Money. And death is a, uh, is a distant second. But we are told in Ezra, the second chapter, verse 68, that when the people arrived in Jerusalem, some of the heads of the family gave free will offerings, an offering made in addition to what is required or pledged. They gave willingly and according to our, their ability which is what and the, and, and the way that God expects them to do. They understood that the coffers were low in Jerusalem due to the invasion. And if the temple and the city was going to be rebuilt and the programs of God were to go forth, they had to go beyond the call of duty in their giving. 
And I thank God for those of you who were able to keep your uh, 2020 uh, stewardship pledge and those of you who tried your very best to do so. But despite this, our coffers also took a hit during the COVID invasion. And as we resume in-person worship, I ask those who are able to, to invest in the work of the Lord by going beyond the call of duty in your giving that we might do the work of the Lord who, that, who has called us to do this in this community. And I also found it very profound that the first official act uh, upon returning home was not the rebuilding of the wall, it was not the rebuilding of the temple, but it was the rebuilding of the altar of the Lord, a place where they can make sacrifices unto the Lord. This was essential because it demonstrated that the people were seeking God's providence and provision, and they were rededicating themselves uh, to the living God and to his commandments. You know, in Matthew 21, 13, Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer. What good is a house of prayer without an altar and without praying people? For it's the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous that avail as much. A little prayer, a little power. A lot of prayer, a lot of power. No prayer, no power. With every senseless murder and act of crime, that's going on here in the streets of Jackson. You know, every time it happens, the call goes out that we need to increase our police presence. But I come today to tell you that the only thing to alter crime is the altar. And the people of God must not, must not only rebuild the altar in the church, but we also must rebuild it in the home and then put them to good use. And in Ezra 3.10, when the time came for the builders to lay the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their vestment were stationed to praise the Lord with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, according to the direction of King David of Israel. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord, for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. And verse 11 tells us that all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was being laid. They didn't wait until the temple was built to, uh, to give out their shout. They shouted in advance for what was not as though it was. And we too can shout this morning because as we resume in-person worship, we don't have to wait for a foundation be, to be laid because our foundation has already been laid, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. He laid ours when he laid down his life at Calvary. All we have to do is to build up on what has already been laid. For if we build up on anything else, it's like building up on sinking sand. In Ezra chapter 3, the emphasis is placed on unity. In verse 1, he tells us that the people to gather together as one. In verse 9, he tells us that the workers stood together. In verse 11, he tells us that the Levites uh, and, or the priests, they, they sang together. Their task was varied, but they all had one goal before them, to bring glory to God and to rebuild the temple. My prayer as we resume in-person worship is that unity would be one of our focal points. For where there is unity, there is strength. I pray that we are one church, will live out its name by indeed being one, one in the work of the Lord. And verse 12 tells us that at this point, their oneness was interrupted. As the young folks shouted for joy, and the old folk wept with a loud voice. Why were they weeping on such a joyful occasion? I believe that by answering that question, we will also uncover some very valuable truth that we can repurpose 
as we resume in-person gathering here at We Are One. The reason why there was weeping is because the old folks had seen the original temple that Solomon built over 75 years ago. And the blueprint that they saw of the new temple did not measure up. They longed for the good old days and was haunted by the ghosts of the past, and they wept. They remembered the grandeur. They remembered all of the gold and with all of the vessels and the glory of the temple that Solomon built. They remember the pride that it brought them by being one of the wonders of the ancient world. A temple that Solomon gave the builders a blank check, sparing no cost. And it said that if that temple was built today, it would cost multiple billions of dollars. They remember the temple that housed the Ark of the Covenant and the mercy seat. They remember that within the Ark, were tablets contained that Moses brought down from the mountain. They remembered Aaron's rod that budded, and they remembered the pot of manna that was gathered up while they were in the wilderness. They remembered the Shekinah glory cloud that filled the temple. They remembered and they wept because this next temple would not measure up. And as the young folks shouted for joy, the old folk wept with a loud voice. It's unfortunate when the unity of God's people is shattered because generations look in the opposite direction. The seniors were looking with longing for Solomon's temple. The young folk were just glad to be out of exile, out of captivity, to be able to praise God even with all of the gold trapping and the stained glass windows. There are some with us today who are clinging to their ex, clinging to former things, to things of the past, remembering, remembering the glory days. What those who remember Solomon's temple did not remember was that it was God's glory filling the building, building that made it the house of God. That's why in Matthew 24, 1, when Jesus left, left the temple and was walking away, the disciples came up to him and said, Lord, let us show you all of the buildings of the temple. And he said to them, not one stone will be left standing upon the other. This lets us know that the definition of the church is God gathered people. And, and the building is where the gathered people gathers. And as followers of Christ, we must be prepared for new ways to worship, new ways to look at church, and new ways to serve God and his people. To do so, we have to let go of our, our ex to get to our next. We need to look at how and where God is working today and be thankful for the opportunity he has given us in them. We can, be, can become so trapped in what God did in the past that we totally miss what he is doing today. In Isaiah 43, 19, God says, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. Letting us know that we have to let, let go of our ex to get to our next. We are told in verse 12 that while many of the old folks will, there were also many who shouted aloud for joy. In that number were more people who did not remember the first temple than those who did. They had no idea of what the temple looked like or the glory that had been in it. All they remembered was a life of captivity, a life of bondage in a foreign land, of having to sing the songs of Zion in that foreign land. No doubt many of these people had been born during the time of Israel's captivity in Babylon, and all they could remember was their slavery. And they also remembered how God and his power had delivered them from that slavery. They could not remember that first temple, but they were thankful for the laying of the foundation of the first, of the new. These people could not remember 
the good old days. But they could see that a new day of opportunity had done for them, and they embraced it wholeheartedly with joy. And although this was an, an oral society and story of the good old days was passed down, but the young folks were excited about what God was doing in their present day. It's easy to err on either side of this thing of weeping and shouting. Some folks are so caught up in the past that they cannot get excited about, about what God is doing in the present. Still, there are others who are so willing to embrace the newest trend and method that they forget about what God did and how he worked yesterday. They are too quick in removing their ancient landmarks. The seniors thought of the juniors as revolutionary and irreverent, and the juniors thought of the seniors as dinosaurs. The seniors must be willing to learn from the juniors and the juniors from the senior in order for us to do the work of the Lord in this present day. And we are told in verse 13 that no one could distinguish the sound of the shouts from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise. This verse lets us know that it's possible to unite the shouts of joy with that of weeping. The young and the old, the traditional and the hip hop must work side by side if the work of the Lord is to go forth. You know, after all has been said and done, God always has the last say so regarding every matter because he's sovereign. Hear what he says in Haggai 2, 9, second chapter, the ninth verse, about this same temple that some wept when the foundation was laid while others rejoiced. This is what the word says in Haggai Two and nine. This temple may not be as great as the first one, but I am here with you. And the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former. And in this place I will give you peace. In other words, what's to come will be better than that which has been. We have to let go of our ex to receive our next. When we think about Solomon's temple, even though the glory of the Lord was in it, in this new temple that they were building, Jesus would walk in it. God used the message of Haggai to bring hope and encouragement to all the people of Israel. His message still gives hope to us in this day. We live in a day when many are discouraged and wonder about the relevance of the church in this modern world. And others wonder what the, what the future holds for the house of God. But we have the same promise that God gave them. Things might not be like they used to be before COVID-19, but the same God who reigned then reigned now. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We certainly cannot ignore the past but the past must be a rudder that guides us and not an anchor to hold us back. We have to let go of our ex to get to our next. God wanted the temple to be rebuilt and he had, had the resources to do it with. He could have spoken this temple into existence the same way that he did creation of the universe. But God has chosen to do his work through his people. He provides the resources, but willing hands must do the work. I have a question for you today. Are you available for God's work? You know, and, and we have so many people who have joined church, but they have not joined in God's works. The call of the church to go ye into all of the world, making disciples of, of men, women, girls, and boys, that's a call for all of us. And it's also been said that the, the church is but one generation away from being irreverent. It has been said that the church is but one generation away from being irrelevant. If you don't believe me, 
I ask you just to look around. And if the older believers do not equip the younger believers to be disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, then the future of the church as we know it will be in jeopardy. To some folks, when they hear the word change, it's a synonym for conforming. But where there's love, change becomes a, a synonym for cooperation with one another and concern for one another. One of the many things that I have learned with the doors of the church being closed for over a year is how much I love each and every one of you. For absence in deeds makes the heart thunder. I've learned that church is indeed family. And as a family grows and matures, some things have to fall away and other things must, have, must take its place. This happens in life, this happens in our home, and it also must happen in the house of God. Another thing I've learned just by being with you on today is the meaning of Psalms 133.1. How good and pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell together in unity, in in-person worship. It's good, y'all. It's good to see you, and it's good to be seen by you. My message that I would like to leave with you on today is let go of your ex to get to your next. And so be it, and amen. If you've joined the church, again, and if you have not joined in the work of the Lord, I invite you to do so today. For the ship that we are on is the old ship of Zion. It's not the love boat. And on this ship, there are no passengers. You are either a member of the crew or you are stowaway. You are someone here for a free ride. And if you have not joined the church, I extend to you now an invitation to do so, to come to Jesus. And the way that you join is not with your signature, but with your mouth. For if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you are saved. It's as simple as that. But if you would like to know more, our contact information is on the screen. I would also like uh, to invite you to join, you, join us on Wednesday night from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time for an hour of power. It consists of 30 minutes of studying the Word of, of God followed by 30 minutes of going to Him on the altar in prayer. Join us if you will. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and grant you his peace. Shalom.